Hi everybody. So back again with another look into the Reformation and the Enlightenment period. And this is the main person that I'm investigating, Ferdinand Christian Bauer, German Protestant theologian and founder and leader of the new Tübingen School of Theology named for the University of Tübingen, where Bauer studied and taught following Hegel's theory of dialectic. Bauer agreed that second century Christianity represented the synthesis of two opposing theses, Jewish Christianity, Petrine Christianity, and Gentile Christianity, Pauline Christianity. This and the rest of Bauer's work had a profound impact on higher criticism of biblical and related texts. Adolf Hillingfield followed Bauer's lead and edited the Tübingen School's journal. Though he was less radical than Bauer, a patristic scholar and philosopher at Tübingen. Okay, so I've actually looked up the pronunciation of this name. It's Tübingen. Albert Schwiegler gave the school's theories their most vigorous expression. The school's influence peaked in the 1840s but was waning by the early 20th century. Bauer's views were radical, but one thing is certain New Testament study since his time has had a different colour, H.S. Nash. He had a number of followers who, in many cases, modified his positions and the groundwork laid by Bauer continued to be built upon in the 21st century. He went 1809 to the University of Tübingen. Here he studied for a time under Ernst Bengel, grandson of the eminent New Testament critic Johann Albrecht Bengel. At this early stage in his career, he seemed to have been under the influence of the old Tübingen school, but at the same time, the philosophers Johann Gottlieb Fichte and Frederick Schelling were creating a wide and deep impression. In 1817, Bauer returned to the Theological Seminary at Blaubeuren as professor. This move marked a turning point in his life for he now set to work on the investigations on which his reputation rests. He had already in 1817 written a review of G. Kayser's Biblische Theologie for Bengals Urchiv für Theologie. Its tone was moderate and conservative. So what's really important about this, guys, because this is where this anti-Paul theology has come from. Simon Magus and Paul. Bauer rested his ideas about the New Testament on the Clementines and his ideas about the Clementines on St. Epiphanes, who found the writing used by an Ebertine sect in the 4th century. The Judeo-Christian sect at that date rejected St. Paul as an apostle. It was assumed that this 4th century opinion represented the Christianity of the 12 apostles. Paulism was originally a heresy and a schism from the Jewish Christianity of James and Peter and the rest. Marcion was the leader of the Pauline sect in its survival in the 2nd century using only the Pauline gospel, St. Luke, in its original form and epistles of St. Paul without the pastoral epistles. The Clementine literature had its first origin in the Apostolic Age and belonged to the original Jewish Petrine legal church. It is directed wholly against St. Paul and his sect. Simon Magus never existed. It is a nickname for St. Paul. Now, you know, I've actually heard that Simon Magus was a nickname for St. Peter because it was Simon Peter. Now, I'm not saying that Peter was Simon Magus at all and I'm not saying that Paul was Simon Magus, but... What I'm saying is, is that linking Simon Peter and Simon, the name, the early Roman Catholic Church says that it was founded by St. Peter because he's the little rock. And that's really a biblical misinterpretation. But they had to have some official story that one of the apostles started the Roman Catholic Church. When I've heard it was actually Simon Magus that started the Roman Catholic Church. So, you know, who knows? So why is this confusion here between the starter of the Roman church being Simon Peter, there is Simon Magus, and now they're saying that Simon is Paul. How is the name Simon Magus leaked to Paul at all? It's rearing its head again today, an attack on the scriptures of Paul. The Acts of the Apostle compiled in the 2nd century have borrowed their mention of Simon from the earliest form of Clementines. Catholicism under the presidency of Rome was the result of the adjustment between the Petrine and the Pauline sections of the church in the second half of the 2nd century. 
Now, I've spoken on Marcionism before. Marcion of Sinope was an early Christian theologian in the early Christianity. Marcion preached that God had sent Jesus Christ, who was an entirely new alien God, distinct from the vengeful God of Israel, who had created the world. He considered himself a follower of Paul the Apostle. And it ties in with the Zoroastrian sort of dualism and the Demiurge, whom he believed to have been the only true apostle of Jesus Christ. According to Marcion, the God of the Old Testament, who he called Demiurge, the creator of the material universe, is a jealous tribal deity of the Jews whose law represented legalistic reciprocal justice and who punishes mankind for its sins through suffering and death. In contrast, the God that Jesus professed is an altogether different being, a universal God of compassion and love who looks upon humanity with benevolence and mercy. Marcion also produced a book, Antithesis, which is no longer extant, contrasting the demiurge of the Old Testament with the Heavenly Father of the New Testament. It's just so bizarre that we have Hegel using thesis, antithesis and synthesis as his philosophy, and here we've got Marcion writing a book called Antithesis. I'm just wondering if this book actually is extant. Perhaps it's in some library of a rabbi who's handed it down for generations. And, you know, in this image here, it says antithesis is in fact a word from ancient Greek which directly translates to opposite. When we talk about antithesis in the English language, we are referring to a phrase which contains two contrasting <laughs> ideas. Antithesis is used to express opposing ideas in a more vivid fashion in order that it has more of an impact on the person listening to or reading the language. I mean, how ironic can we get? We've got Marcion bringing this pro-Paul, only Paul, the scripture we should be reading, and we've got Hegel bringing in his Hegelian dialectic. Now we've got Ferdinand Christian Bauer saying, no, Paul the Apostle is Simon Maggots. Marcion held Jesus to be the son of the Heavenly Father, but understood the incarnation of docetic manner, that Jesus' body was only an imitation of the material body and consequently denied Jesus physical and bodily birth, death and resurrection. You know, we've got this Gnosticism, um, a Gnostic symbol, this uh, double-tailed fish we know comes from Rhodes, if you go back and watch my videos. And Marcion is said to be the son of the Bishop of Pontus. He was likely Philogus of Sinope, Rhodo and Tertullian. Young men in Marcion's age described him as a mariner and a shipmaster, respectively. So he's from a merchant family, possibly from Rhodes, looking at this symbol, the Gnostic symbol here of the fish with the double tail. The secret life of Melusine, says Melusine is the spirit of fresh water, usually depicted as a woman who is a serpent or fish from the waist down, much like the mythical mermaid. She is also frequently illustrated with two tails. The image of Melusine is so famous and enduring that perhaps without knowing her by name, we still recognize her image today as a logo for Starbucks coffee. The legends of Melusine are especially connected with the northern and western areas of France, Luxembourg and the Low Countries. Her name derives from Mere Lucine, mother of Lusignans, connected her with Cyprus where the French Lusignan royal house that ruled from 1192 to 1489 claimed to be her descendants. The legend of Melusine, therefore, is related to the territorial and dynastic expansion of her descendants beyond Lusignan across the Mediterranean to distant Armenia during the Crusades. It was Salome and her husband, the Herods, who actually ruled in this region of Armenia and Georgia. There was also a major trading port in this region on the Black Sea, owned by the Genoan sea trading merchants. Also, Elizabeth Woodville, the White Queen, was said to be a descendant of Melusine, and she was married to King Edward IV of the House of York. So we've got the the War of the Roses, that York was the White Rose and Lancaster was the Red Rose, which united families and became the House of Tudor, the White and the Red Rose. So we've got the Rose of Rhodes uh, and that comes from the goddess Rhodos. This particular coin here from Rhodes actually looks like a fleur-de-lis to me and 
the irony is that this particular goddess shows up in France and the main image of the French royal family is the fleur-de-lis. Also, as I've stated previously, King Herod the Great loved the island of Rhodes and came to their aid several times, especially financially. And I actually have a theory, I think his name actually came from this island as the hero of Rhodes because the name Herod uh, comes from the Greek word for hero. And it says here, the Rhodes Phoenician Greek bilingual inscription are three short bilingual inscriptions found between 1914 and 68 in Rhodes. In all three inscriptions have been suggested to be from Cypriot Phoenician immigrants to Rhodes and have been compared to the Athenian Greek Phoenician inscriptions. However, two out of three inscriptions record grandfather who had non-Cypriot names. So, you know, it's a Phoenician link between Cyprus and Rhodes. Okay, so in this picture with the Starbucks image, it says 16th century theologian Martin Luther referred to Malacene unfavorably several times as a succubus and 19th century composer Felix Mendelssohn wrote a concert overture titled The Fair Malacene. Funny that both of these people are coming up in this series. So that was a little tangent from Marcion. So Catholicism under the presidency of Rome was a result of the adjustment between Petrine and Pauline sections of the church in the second half of the second century. The fourth gospel is a momentum of this reconciliation in which Rome took a leading part having invented the fiction that both Peter and Paul were the founders of her church, both having been martyred at Rome and on the same day in perfect union. Throughout the middle of the 19th century, his theories in many form was dominant in Germany. The demonstration mainly by English scholars of the possibility of the late dates ascribed to the New Testament documents, four epistles of St. Paul and the Apocalypse were the only documents generally admitted as being of early date. And the proof of the authenticity of the Apostolic Fathers and the use of St. John Gospel by Justin Papias and Ignatius gradually brought Bauer's theories into discredit. Of the original school, Adolf Hillingfield may be considered the last survivor. He was introduced to admit that Simon Magus was a real personage, though he persisted that in the Clementines he is meant for St. Paul. In 1847, Hilgenfield dated the original nucleus of the Clementine literate soon after the Jewish War of 70. Successive revisions of it were anti basilidin anti-Valentinian and anti marcionite respectively. Bauer placed the completed form H soon after the middle of the second century and Schillman agreed placing R as the revision of the 211 and 230. Other writers dated both H and R to the, between the second and fourth centuries. So, you know, we've got this guy who's creating confusion within Christianity. Does he have an agenda or is he just confused? It says, meantime, Bauer had exchanged one master in philosophy for another. Schleimacher for Hegel. In doing so, he had adopted completely the Hegelian philosophy of history without philosophy. He has said, history is always for me dead and dumb. The change of view is illustrated clearly in the essay published in Turbinger Zutrift for 1831 on the Christ party in the Corinthian church. The trend of which is suggested by the title in English, The Christ Party in the Corinthian Community, The Opposition of Pauline and Petrine Christianity in the Earliest Church, The Apostle Peter in Rome. Bauer contended that the Apostle Paul was opposed in Corinth by a Jewish Christian party that wished to set up its own form of Christian religion instead of his universal Christianity. He found traces of a keen conflict of parties in the post-apostolic age which have passed into mainstream of early Christian historiography. So, you know, we've got this Bauer here who's a, a fan of Hegel. He was, goes to the same university as Hegel. We've got Bruno Bauer who's, you know, um, I'll go into later. He's a teacher of Karl Marx, Frederick Engels. He's a student of Hegel. They're both attacking the foundations of Christianity being, according to Revelation, the apostles, the foundation stones of the New Jerusalem. And it starts around this time of enlightenment. You know, they're both called Bauer. I can't find any link to these Rothschild families. Their history seems to be pretty scarce. 
you know, I have found information on Bruno Bauer in a Rothschild book, a random Rothschild book that somebody went into their Rothschild libraries and they had access to these libraries to write this book. And in the book, they mentioned that Bruno Bauer was on a train with Rothschild agents and this particular Rothschild couple and the train crashed. You know, so this this random little piece of information that links Bruno Bauer to Rothschild agents. So, you know, uh, that's sold for me on this guy. But is this Ferdinand Bauer of the same family? You know, they both have these sort of benign backgrounds. It's like there's no information on their parents or anything. They've been whitewashed pretty much. Bruno Bauer argues against the existence of Jesus. You know, it's an undermining of Christianity and the Western society. Again, we are replacing it with cultural Marxism, socialism. And Ferdinand Bauer denies the transcendence of Jesus. So he says he was just a man. So the theory is further developed in later work, 1835, the year in which David Strauss' Leben Jesu was published. In this, Bauer attempts to prove that the false teachers mentioned in the second epistle of Timothy and the epistle of Titus are Gnostics, particularly the Marcionites of the second century, and consequently that the pastoral epistles were produced in the middle of the second century in opposition to Gnosticism. He next proceeded to investigate other Pauline epistles and Acts of the Apostles in the same manner published his results in 1845 under the title Paulus de Apostle Je Jesu Christi. In this he contends that only the epistle to the Galatians, first and second epistles to the Corinthians and epistles to the Romans were genuinely Pauline and that Paul of the Acts and the Apostles is a different person from the Paul of these genuine epistles the author being Paulinist, who with an eye to the different parties in the church is at pains to represent Peter as far as possible as a Paulinist and Paul as far as possible as a Petronist. Bauer was prepared to apply his theory to the whole of the New Testament in the words of H.S. Nash. He carried a sweeping hypothesis into the examination of the New Testament. He considered those writing alone genuine in which the conflict between Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians is clearly marked. He turns his attention to the gospel and here again finds the authors were conscious of the conflict of parties. The gospels reveal a mediating or conciliatory tendency on the part of the writers or redactors. The gospels, in fact, are adaptations of the redactions of the older gospels, such as the gospel of the Hebrews, of, of Peter and the Egyptians, or the Ebionites. The Petri Matthew bears the closest relationship to this original gospel. The Pauline Luke is later and arose independently. Mark represents a still later development according to Bauer and the account in John is idealistic. It does not possess historical truth and cannot and does not really lay claim to it. It makes you wonder why this guy even bothers to call himself a Christian at all. Now I can see here what's uh, possibly happening is that, you know, we're talking about this Jewish emancipation around this time, Hegel, they're bringing up all these philosophies. And it seems to me that what he's doing here is trying to create a division. And this is what these people do. They love to create divisions. And he's creating a division between the Jewish apostles or the apostles that were sent out to the southern kingdom, the Jews first, as the Bible says, and second to the Gentiles. So first the message of the kingdom went out to the, the southern kingdom and then it went out to the Gentiles, which is mistranslated, which is actually the lost ten tribes, not to some random Gentile people against Jewish people. And so here in the Strong's Concordance translation of Gentile, it says Helene, a Greek, usually a name for a Gentile. A Hellene, the native word for a Greek, it is, however, a term wide enough to include all Greek-speaking, i.e. educated non-Jews. In the Strong's Concordance for Jew from this particular scripture, it says Judean, belonging to Judah. So why would they have Jew and Greek? So the whole Bible is about the Israelites prophecy to the descendants of Abraham, the Israelites. And 
at this point in time, the two kingdoms, north and south, had been divided. We go to Ezekiel 37, and it says, One kingdom, one king. Again, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, As for you, son of man, take a stick for yourself and write on it, for Judah and for the children of Israel, his companions. Then take another stick and write on it, for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and for all the house of Israel is his companions. Then join them one to another for yourself into one stick, and they will become one in your hand. And when the children of your people speak to you, saying, Will you not show us what you mean by these? Say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Surely I will take the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim, and the tribes of Israel, his companions, and I will join them with it in the stick of Judah and make them one stick, and they will be one in my hand. And the sticks on which you write will be in your hand before their eyes. Then say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Surely I will take the children of Israel from among the nations wherever they have gone and will gather them from every side and bring them into their own land. I will make them one nation in the land on the mountains of Israel and one king shall be over them, this is Jesus, and they shall no longer be two nations, nor shall they ever be divided into two kingdoms again. So they shall not defile themselves anymore with their idols, nor with their detestable things, nor with any of their transgressions. But I will deliver them from all the, their dwelling places in which they have sinned and will cleanse them. They shall be my people and I will be their God. So tell me why in this verse of Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, so we've shown the translation being from Judea, from Judah, and also to the Greek, the Hellene. Why would God unite the tribe of Judah with the pagan Greeks who have no relation to Israel? Why would he unite Judah to Japheth? There's no scripture saying that. It was to the lost tribes of Israel in Greece that Paul went to in this particular scripture. Now, I actually think this is really important concerning the German people and the people of Europe because it says in Ezekiel that he will send them into their own land. And in the next video, I'm going to investigate where the German people come from in particular because a lot of these philosophers are coming out of Germany, but the mainly the European people. And our traditional story goes that the and Indo-European people, so they are related to the Persians and the Indians and the language is all united, so therefore they're the same people. But I think this is completely wrong and we find it just in this scripture here is when we look at the interpretation of Helene, it says here that it can refer to Greeks or anybody who speaks Greek or is educated as a Greek. Now, that indicates to me that if we know and believe that the lost tribes were amongst the Greeks, then basically they were speaking Greek. They had an Indo-European language. The Greeks were descendants of Japheth. They were the sea people. So we are told in Genesis that Japheth will dwell amongst the tents of Shem. Israel are the descendants of Shem. So basically we have the Israelites here being referred to as Helene. They're speaking Greek. So the German language, the European languages which come from Indo-European aren't necessarily Indo-European people. They're people that have dwelled amongst these people for long enough to convert to their language. Now we see that Paul also went to the Romans and into Italy and when we look at who makes up the people of Italy, it's two groups. It's the Etruscans is one of the main groups and the Sabines. So when we go back to the Etruscans, we see here that it says the Etruscan civilization was developed by a people of Eturia in ancient Italy with a common language and culture who formed a federation of city-states. After conquering adjacent lands, its territories covered 
at its greatest extent roughly what is now Tuscany, Western Umbria and Northern Lazio, as well as what are now Po Valley, Emilia Romagna, Southeastern Lombardy, Southern Veneto and Western Campania. So if we look at the Ratian people were a confederation of Alpine tribes whose language and culture was related to those of the Etruscans. Before the Roman conquest, they inhabited present-day Tyrol in Austria, eastern Switzerland and the Alpine regions of northeastern Italy. After the Roman conquest, the province of Ratia was formed, and which included parts of present-day Germany south of the Danube. The etymology of the name Raiti is uncertain. The Roman province of Raetia was named after these people. Ancient sources characterised the Raiti as Etruscan people who were displaced from the Po Valley by the Gauls. We've got Paul going to Rome. We've got the Roman Etruscans and the Raiti tribes of the Alpine regions of Switzerland, Austria and Germany. From Live Science, September 29, 2021. The discovery could have just settled a 2,400 year old debate. A new genetic analysis may have finally revealed the origin of the Etruscans, a mysterious people whose civilization thrived in Italy centuries before the founding of Rome. It turns out the enigmatic Etruscans were local to the area with nearly identical genetics to their Latin speaking neighbors. This finding contradicts earlier theories that the Etruscans, who for centuries spoke a now extinct non-Indo-European language that was remarkably different from the others in the region, came from somewhere different from their Latin-speaking neighbours. Instead, both groups appear to be migrants from the Pontiac Caspian Steep, a long thin swath of land stretching from the North Black Sea around Ukraine to the North Caspian Sea in Russia. After arriving in Italy during the Bronze Age, the early speakers of Etruscan put down roots, assimilating speakers of other languages to their own cultures as they flourished into a great civilization. The finding challenges simple assumptions that genes equal language and suggests a more complex scenario that may have involved the assimilation of early Italic speakers by the Etruscan speech community. David Caramelli an anthropology professor at the University of Florence said in a statement, the cities as sophisticated as those of the ancient Greeks trade networks as lucrative as the Phoenicians and a vast wealth to rival ancient Egypt's. The Etruscan civilization, the first known superpower of the Western Mediterranean, had a brilliance matched only by the mysterious surroundings, its language and its origins. Rising to the height and power in central Italy in the 7th century BC, Etruria dominated the region for centuries until the event of the Roman Republic, which had but conquered the Etruscans before the middle of the 3rd century BC, finally assimilating them by 90 BC. The ancient Greek writer Herodotus, widely considered to be the first historian, believed that the Etruscans descended from Anatolian and Aegean peoples who fled westward following a famine in what is now Tur Western Turkey. Another Greek historian, Dionysus of Halicarnassus counted that the pre-Roman civilization, despite their Greek customs and non-Indo-European language, were natives of the Italian peninsula. While recent archaeological evidence, which shows little evidence of migration, has been tilting in favour of Halicarnassus' argument, the lack of ancient DNA from the region has made genetic investigations inconsistent. The study researchers said in a statement, to resolve this, the science collected Ancient genomic information from the remains of 82 individuals who lived between 2,800 and 1,000 years ago across 12 archaeological sites in central and southern Italy. Well, why can't they do this for the Israelites in Israel? Compare them to who's there now. After comparing DNA from those 82 individuals with that of the other ancient and modern peoples, the scientists discovered that despite the strong difference in customs and language, the Etruscans and their Latin neighbours shared a genetic profile with each other. In fact, the ancestry of both groups points to people who first arrived in the region from the Pontiac Caspian Steep during the Bronze Age. After these early Etruscans settled in northern and eastern Italy, the gene pool remains relatively stable. Across both the Iron Age and the absorption of the Etruscan civilization into the Roman Republic, then after the rise of the Roman Empire, 
there was a great influx of new genes likely as a result of the mass migrations the empire brought about. So, you know, basically what it's saying here is that the Etruscans are from around the Caucasus, from around the Bronze Age. They had a different language than the Indo-European speakers. That language seems to have gone, seems to have disappeared. And, you know, it reeks of being lost tribes. Now, let's not forget that it wasn't just the Assyrian captivity that caused certain tribe members from Israel to migrate west. Even at the time of the exodus from Egypt, there was people from the tribes of Israel that left and didn't go into the wilderness with the group led by Moses. Now, the Bronze Age is approximately 3,300 BC to 1,200 BC, so that's a lot earlier than the Assyrian captivity and deportation. So it's likely that these could have possibly been tribes from the earlier exodus out of Egypt. If the Apostle Paul was going to these tribes, then they would have been descendants of the lost tribes of Israel. And as I said, I will show that in the next video. I personally believe that we are being lied to with this Indo-European story, which then ties back to the classicism of German romanticism. And that brought us into this Aryan Nazism and pagan worship of the German people, which I think may be a mythology that doesn't belong to them. So what he's doing is, is quite deceptive and he's creating this division in Christianity. Bauer's theory starts with this supposition that Christianity was gradually developed out of Judaism. Uh, no. See also a list of events in early Christianity. Before it could become a universal religion, it had to struggle with Jewish limitations and to overcome them. The early Christians were Jewish Christians to whom Jesus was the Messiah. Paul, on the other hand, represented a breach with Judaism, the temple and the law. Um, this is, you know, just very decept deceptive serpent talk, in my opinion. Thus, there was some antagonism between the Jews, Jewish apostle Peter, James and John, and Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles. Paul was a, a Benjamite, so he was well aware of, of all this. And these apostles were aware that the scripture was going out to the lost tribes. Now, why would Ferdinand Christian Bauer say this? Israel, if indeed he is from this rabbi class and from these people that were involved with Marcionism, the false Christ, people that say they're Jews but are not, according to Revelation, then it's within their interest to try to keep people ignorant. So what they're doing is creating a Hegelian argument, dividing Paul the Apostle from the other apostles and saying that they went out to the Jews and that Paul was a false apostle going out to the Gentiles, trying to hide the fact that Paul the Apostle was actually going out to Ephraim so that they could be united with the Judahite people as one kingdom. And at this present moment in time, we've got this Jewish problem in Europe. It's a problem of should the Jews be emancipated? Are the Jews actually legitimately part of the lost tribes of Israel? I mean, that's a really big question as well. And the biggest secret that they want to remain a secret is that they're not. They're not part of the lost tribes of Israel and they want the lost tribes of Israel to remain ignorant of who they are. We're having this same argument arise today in the Hebrew Roots movement, which is a belief that really denies Jesus. When you get into Hebrew Roots, a lot of people reject Jesus. And why is that? Because fundamentally Hebrew Roots philosophy is about uniting the Gentile under the control of the Jew. All the Jew needs is to see that Jesus was the Messiah and convert. It's Christian Zionism and it's completely unscriptural. Before they know it, they're saying he's just a man. Then they're saying Paul was a false apostle. And then they start to say that all scripture is false and that Jesus didn't exist. And I personally know people who have come to this conclusion through Hebrew roots. It also brings people back under the law. And when they're under the law, they can be controlled and manipulated by a priesthood. This argument of trying to deceive people 
of who they actually are and what their birthright is. This struggle continued down the middle of the second century. In short, the conflict between patronism and Paulism is, as Karl Schwartz puts it, the key to the literature of the first and second centuries. Bell was a theologian and historian as well as a biblical critic. As early as 1834, he published a strictly theological work, a strong defense of Protestantism on the lines of Schleimacher's Globenschler and vigorous reply to J. Moller's Symbolic. This was followed by large histories of dogma, the value of these works is impaired somewhat by Bauer's habit of making the history of dogma conform to the formula of Hegel's philosophy and produce which only serve to obscure the truth and profundity of his concept of history as a true development of the human mind. Bauer, however, soon came to attach more importance to personality and to distinguish more carefully between religion and philosophy works uh, in five volumes during the years of 1853 to 1860, partly by Bauer himself and partly by his son Ferdinand Bauer and his son-in-law Edward Zeller. So, you know, I, I think this, is, this guy also influenced modern Christianity. Zeller is a Jewish surname and I just question all of these people with these surnames and opinions that are contrary to what they're profile says their profile saying that they're both christian and reformers so let's have a look at some of bauer's beliefs it's got bruno bauer christ and the caesars the origin of christianity romanized greek culture it says bruno bauer's name and some of his ideas have long been known secondhand through albert schwitz's the quest of the historical jesus but until now none of bauer's books has been translated the result of the extremity of Bauer's reviews, which were well beyond the pale, even the most critical of mainstream scholars. Bauer played the same role vis a vis. His better known colleague, Ferdinand Christian Bauer, founder of the Tubingen School of Criticism, that Caspar Schwenkfeld did regarding Martin Luther. In both cases, the more famous pioneers set an example, which inspired another to go even farther in the same direction. And the trailblazer balked at going the whole length of the trail marked out. If F.C. Bauer argued that the Apostle Paul had written none of the Pauline epistles, save Romans, Galatians 1 and 2 Corinthians, Bruno Bauer, following the same logic, concluded that Paul had written none at all. So can we see this Bauer, Bauer agenda here? It's like I said before about the Hebrew Roots movement. First, they destroy the apostles and then they destroy Jesus. And before you know it, you're going back to the law. If David Frederick Strauss showed that the historical Jesus had become obscured behind the mid screen of the Gospels, Bruno Bauer maintained that the historical Jesus had never had any existence at all, being rather a fictive character created by the evangelist Mark. Bauer's theories were no mere flights of subjective fancy. He established a method and even movement, the Dutch radical school, whose greatest follower was W.C. Van Manen. So can we see what's happening here? We can see that basically it's a watering down of Christianity, slowly taking away first Jesus' divinity, then attacking the apostles, and then we've got Bruno Bauer saying that they didn't exist at all. They had to boil the frog, starting with cold water in the analogy, opposed to throwing the frog in the boiling water. The casual reader will surely conclude that Bauer spends altogether too much time on the Caesars and not enough on Christian origins. The wild point of the book is that the Christ figure is not so much the historical incarnation of the Divine Spirit as the literary incarnation of the Zeitgeist. Bauer seeks to show how Christianity emerged at the beginning of the second century as a synthesis of world-weary, cynic, stoic, introspective piety with the Jewish belief in monotheism and divine law. For Bauer, the most important individual catalyst for Christian emergence was not Jesus, whom Mark created, but Seneca, many of whose maxims and ideals appear unaltered at the heart of the New Testament. It was Seneca who delineated what would come to be known as the Christian ethic and the origin of the Jesus Christ fiction was Seneca's prediction that one day a human embodiment of the ideal should appear in the flesh. 
All this received a boost from the Platonic Stoic Jewish philosopher Philo from Alexandria, whose ideas in turn are writ large in the Gospel of John. In Bauer's reconstruction, it is only an element of Hellenistic Roman mix that Judaism played a role at all in that formation of Christianity. He even faults Strauss for naively accepting the assumption that there had been a pre-Christian Jewish concept of a Messiah at all. Reading the precent Bruno Bauer, one has the eerie feeling that a century of New Testament scholarship may find itself ending up where it began. For instance, the work of Burton Mack, Vernon Robbins and others make a powerful case for understanding the gospel as cynic stoic in tone. Abraham J. Malheber and others have shown how great a debt to cynicism and stoicism the Pauline epistles owe. Walter Schmithals demonstrated how that Corinthian epistles deal with issues known to us from secondhand Gnosticism. Many now admit there was no single Messiah concept in pre Christian Judaism. Robert M. Fowler, Frank Kermode and Randall Helms have demonstrated how thoroughly the Gospels smack of fictional composition. Thus, from many directions, New Testament researchers seem to be converging uncannily on these that Bruno Bauer set forth over a century ago. So, you and I know that Bruno Bauer is a Rothschild agent and he is a Bauer, so he's probably a Rothschild family member. We can't prove this, but there's a big connection there that is that of the family name and that he was associated with these people. Why should we trust this Rothschild? In this paper here by Peter C. Hodgson, F.C. Bauer's interpretation of Christianity's relationship to Judaism. In his lecture on New Testament theology, Ferdinand Christian Bauer emphasizes the difference that distinguish the authors of the individual New Testament writings from each other. The greatest difference bears upon Christianity's relationship to Judaism along with all that bears upon the person of Jesus and how the Christian principle is grasped. Bauer's identification of the Jewish question as front and centre for New Testament research explains why a renewed interest in the study of Jewish Christianity on the part of contemporary scholars finds itself engaged positively or negatively with Bauer. So the Jewish question was the problem with Jews at this time and emancipation of the Jew. Racialist Orientalist critique of Bauer. My concern at the outset is with the negative engagement from a perspective known as Orientalism which criticizes Western stereotypes about the East. This perspective is well represented by Sean Kelly. He says that Hegel's racialized views of history are transferred into the arena of biblical scholarship, especially under the influence of Bauer, who takes over Hegel's fundamental antithesis between the Western free Greeks and the non-Western servile Orientals and interjects it into the very heart of his analysis of emerging Christianity. Much as I would like to defend Hegel against such an assertion, my focus in this essay is solely of Bauer, Kelly writes. Now, here, Western free Greeks. Now, we read that scripture before about the Hellenes and we read Ezekiel. So, we've got Hegel here. They're trying to distinguish there's some difference between the Western people being Greeks and not lost tribes by juxtaposing them to the servile Orientals, like Somehow we've got Orientals and we've got Greeks and they're completely different to the Judahites or the Lost Tribe people. And that Christianity arose out of these Gentile peoples with no relation to the Lost Tribes of Israel. In this summary form, such a critique is a gloss caricature, but still there is a valid issue at stake. For our early 21st century sensibilities, Bauer's mid-19th century interpretation of Judaism is problematic on at least two counts. First, the characteristic mark of Judaism is often described as particularistic, by which Bauer means that the God of Israel is understood to be the God of the Jewish people alone, the chosen people. See how they're confirming in the mind of Christians that the Jews are the chosen people? and that the Christians are just the Gentiles, rather than the God of human beings as such, including Gentiles. So is this the agenda here to 
distinguish in the minds of Christians that they are Gentiles and not descendants of Israel and that the Jews who more than likely are just an Arabic Chaldean tribe mixed with Ashkenazi Magog Jews are somehow the inheritors of Abraham's blessing. Second Bauer understands Christianity to be the absolute religion which supersedes not only Jewish religion but other religions to absorbing them into itself and transforming them. If particularism and suppression are markers of Orientalism, so be it. But Bauer's views are not racialist or crypto-racist. He is not motivated by racial prejudice or religious antagonism, but by the attempt to understand how Christianity emerged as a religion distinct from Judaism. It's because Christianity didn't arise out of Judaism or the Talmud, while at the same time Jewish factors remain an essential component of it. This is a legitimate historical question. How does historical novelty occur within the ongoing continuum of history? It does so, and here Bauer acknowledges his indebtedness to Hegel, the Kabbalist, not through a supernatural incursion of the divine, but through the process by which history changes. The interplay of power and interpretations, or in logical terms, the process of identity, difference and mediation. Because history is unending, so also the process of identity, difference and mediation. Because history is unending, so also the process repeats itself in endless configurations. The unity of logic and history indicates, for Bauer as well as Hegel, that the idea and the real are inextricably intertwined. Logic is historicized and reason is introduced into history. That kind of sounds like to me another version of all the world's a stage and all the men and women merely play it. Does this mean that the idea is written down in a script form and then acted out in the reality of our lives? So Hegel basically got his idea from the Oriental religions and karma, or as David Icke says, problem, action, solution. Today we are inclined to think in terms of identity rather than particularity and we affirm the equivalent validity of the major world religions rather than the superiority of one over the others. The language of identity while neutral leaves the question open to us. For example, how the identity of Christianity differs from the identity of Judaism. Well, that's been what my videos are completely about how Christianity has nothing to do with Judaism. According to what Jesus said in Revelation, the Jews that call themselves Jews but are not come preaching a different doctrine. A question that contemporary scholarship rather prefers to avoid, but arguments about the superiority or inferiority of religion have proven to be fruitless and harmful, and most serious religious scholars today embrace some form of pluralism or recognition of equivalent validity pluralism, dualism. In this respect, Bauer's approach is no longer acceptable. He views the religions in the progressive scheme and indeed seems to make negative generalized remarks about Judaism, exaggerated perhaps by his dialectical oppositions. But if we look below the surface and at detailed analysis, we get a different picture. Bauer's critical New Testament studies began with his lengthy article in 1831 on the Christ party in the Corinthian church. Here he encouraged several of the predecessors on the question as to who the opponents were of Paul in Corinth, and in particular whether the Christ party represented Jewish Christianity. The question was not an original one for Bauer, but he advanced the discussion of it in ways that become foundational for subsequent researches. Much of this article was incorporated into his book on Paul in 1845, and the results were summarized in the church history. So I read this scripture from 1 Corinthians and it says 1 Corinthians 1 from 1 down to 12. Um, I'll start from 10 because this is just Paul introducing himself. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing and that there be no division among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it hath been declared unto me, of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Now this I say that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, and I of Apollos, and I of 
Caiaphas and I have Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius. Least any should say that I had baptized in my own name. And I baptized also the household of Stephanus. Besides, I know not whether I baptized any other. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. How on earth could Bauer get from this that there was some division between Paul and Peter? It's quite obvious what's going on here, and it's it's a game of favorites within the church. And the apostles are saying that we're all here to preach the word of Christ. And there's no favors for someone who is learning under Paul or someone who's learning under Apollos or Caiaphas or even under Christ himself. We're all equal under Christ and Christ is not divided. It's pretty obvious that's what this scripture is saying. I'll go on just in case there's something there. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. So, you know, you can go on and read this scripture yourself, but it's pretty obvious here what's happening is these churches are starting to get high and mighty based on who they're studying under. And I think it's even more obvious that Bauer is cherry picking here, trying to find some sort of division in the church. We shall see Bauer came to regard the conflict between opposing tendencies as the driving force of the early Christianity and indeed the whole of history. The following summary of his thesis is based on the first volume of the church history. Bauer begins by claiming that the two parties, Jewish Christians and the Pauline Christians, both have their origin in the figure of Jesus, one side focusing more on the moral religious teachings and the other on his messianic person. In Antioch, 14 years after Paul's conversion, the issue was whether Gentiles could become Christians without circumcision. We may deduce from the Corinthian epistles that a heated confrontation occurred between Peter and Paul, with Peter insisting that Gentile Christians cannot be on the same level with Jewish Christians and Paul holding that the Christians are of equal status. Paul attacked the foundations of the argument that salvation must include observance of the law and circumcision in his earliest epistle, Galatians. Even within the sphere of Jewish history, the law is not the primary and original element. Above it stands the promise to Abraham, which points towards a time when righteousness will become the blessing of all nations. This promise can be fulfilled only when the law gives way to faith. The purpose of the law is a transitional one, to expose sin and prepare humanity to be set free from it. Judaism holds promise and fulfillment apart until the fullness of time has arrived. In the new community of Christ, there are no differences between Jew and Greek. Circumcision and uncircumcision, rather all are one in faith manifesting itself as love. One should keep in mind that these ideas are expressed by Paul a Jew by birth who argues for Christianity on the basis of his knowledge of the Hebrew scriptures from his rabbinic training and his conversation and missionary experience. The conflict here is between two ways of interpreting Judaism in relationship to Christianity, not between Judaism and Hellenism. Paul too could be regarded as a Jewish Christian, but with the radically new interpretation, one emphasizing the presence of the fulfillment in Christ. So when we actually go and read the verse about Paul preaching circumcision and it's in Acts 16, it says, Then came he to Derby and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timotheus, the son of a certain woman which was a Jewess and believed, but his father was a Greek, which was well reported of by the brethren that were at Lystra and Iconium. Him would Paul have to go forth with him and took and circumcised him because of the Jews which were in those quarters. So, I mean, again, we can see that Paul's simply doing this because he knew it would be a stumbling block for the Jews that they were preaching to. And he wanted Timothy to be able to go into these quarters with him because it's the Jews who would have thought Timothy was unclean. 
for they knew all that his father was a Greek. And as they went through the cities, they delivered them the decrees for to keep that were ordained of the apostles and elders which were at Jerusalem. And so were the churches established in the faith and increased in number daily. So Paul is not preaching circumcision to everybody. He's simply taken Timothy on as an apostle and basically wants him to be circumcised because they're preaching to Jews and the Jews would see him as unclean. So how they get this doctrine or this belief out of these scriptures is mind-bending, to be honest. To advance such a bold claim, Paul also had to claim an apostolic authority equal to or greater than that of the older apostles who had known Jesus in the flesh. This is the issue that came up in Corinth and surfaces in the Corinthian epistles. Here the topics of law and circumcision have completely disappeared. Rather, the question concerns the apostolic authority of Paul. Is Paul a true and, and genuine apostle at all? Paul has no empirical proof apart from the results of his missionary labor but only his subjective experience of seeing the lord and being called by him i think they're making a mountain out of a molehill here trying to say that paul is a false apostle when you go and read the scripture and it's nothing of what they're saying the height of the conflict between jewish and pauline christianity occurs after the death of Paul and continues into the second century. Here conflicting principles of authority oppose each other. The principle of Paulism writes Bauer is the emancipation of consciousness from every external authority and elevation of the human spirit to freedom and light. I mean this guy is insane. This guy has an agenda. The human spirit to freedom and light. This sounds very Freemasonic to me. The height of conflict between Jewish and Pauline Christianity occurs after the death of Paul and continues into the second century. The Pauline side is expressed in the Gospel of Luke and the Deutero-Pauline epistles. The Jewish side in Revelation and Hebrews. Papias and Hegesippus, the Ebertonites and Simon Magus. The virulent attacks on Paul found in the pseudo-Clementine homilies have Gnostic associations. Well, how can we trust in it? The Ebonites consider Paul an apostle and false teacher, reject all his epistles, slander his memory, and claim that he was a Gentile by birth, not a Jew. The homilies and recognitions, Paul appears in the character of Simon Magus, preaching a lawless doctrine. The Magus is nothing other than a character of Paul and becomes the great father of heretics representing the views with which Paul is associated by his opponents. But a reconciliation or mediation must also have occurred, otherwise a Catholic church could never have arisen, a church that cut off from itself everything extreme and united opposites within itself. Yeah, it sure did. Bauer hypothesizes that there must have been steps of reconciliation from both sides, but in different ways. The two parties sense that they belong together, act upon each other in the living process of development, each modifying and being modified by another. The first step occurs when baptism comes to replace circumcision as the outward sign of initiation to the saving community with increased numbers of Gentiles converting within circumcision. The issue is resolved as it were on the ground. A second step occurs when Pauline universalism is transferred to Paul or Peter. According to the Clementine writings, Peter, not Paul, is the apostle to the Gentiles and his mission ends with this alleged martyrdom in Rome. Now, what does the Bible say about this? So in Galatians 2, we have this explanation of a, a dispute between Peter and Paul, a very mild one in my opinion. And it seems to be that as it says in Ezekiel that the two sticks in the hand are joined together as one, well, there's a little bit of controversy here because the Jews consider the Gentiles, of the lost tribes who've gone wayward and pagan and not following the law as unclean. You know, we have Peter having this dream of the animals coming down from heaven and the sheet declaring the Gentiles clean. It says here, then 14 years after I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also, and I went up by revelation and communicated with them 
that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. But neither Titus, who was with me being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. And that because of the false brethren unawareness brought in, who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage, into whom we gave place by subjection. No, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel bring us into bondage, to whom we gave place by subjection. No, not, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. But of these who seemed to be somewhat whatsoever they were in maketh no matter to me, God accepteth no man's person. For they who seemed to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. But contrariwise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter, for he that wrought effectively in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me towards the Gentiles. And when James, Caiaphas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship, that we should go unto the heathen and they into the circumcision. Only they would that we should remember the poor, the same which I also was forward to do. So what this is explaining is, is that James, Caiaphas, and John went to the circumcision. They went to the Jew. The Jew from the southern kingdom who who are still preaching the law. And Paul went to the heathen. The heathen is the Greek, the Hellene, the lost ten tribes. And the two of them are uniting the two sticks of Ezekiel to become one in their hand. And it's not without controversy because the Jew thinks that the heathen is unclean. Because the northern kingdom stopped obeying the law and even before they were taken into exile, they were performing pagan worship in their temple. So Paul confronts Peter. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. So do we see what's happening here? These apostles, they're just men. They're not Jesus, right? And Peter is afraid to be seen with those who aren't circumcised because the people who are circumcised might judge him. The circumcised were considering themselves better than the Gentile. You know, Jesus sat with lepers. Jesus sat with Samaritans. He wasn't afraid of the unclean. And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly, according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, If thou being a Jew livest after the manner of Gentiles and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. But if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners. Is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I, through the law, am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. I am crucified with the Christ. Nevertheless, I live yet. Not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the sons of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate grace of God. For if the righteousness comes by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. So there's no, there's no real conflict here between Paul and Peter. It's simply just old habits, basically. The Jews keeping the law, the Gentiles not keeping the law. Now, when we think of the law, this is, this law of circumcision, it's not one of the Ten Commandments. It's one of the lesser laws that was brought in by Moses of Leviticus. So, you know, It doesn't say in the Ten Commandments, be circumcised. 
So Bauer appreciates the contribution of Jewish Christianity to the formation of the Catholic Church without its hierarchical organization which derives from Jewish theocracy, the church would never have survived against hostile forces and become a viable historical institution. Thus, Jewish Christianity remains a permanent and essential feature of Christianity and the tension between it and Paulism furnishes the dynamic by which the church exists in the world. They are the two factors of the historical movement, the ideal factor and the real factor. When one factor threatens to submerge the other, resistance occurs and a new balance is established. For the church is and remains an ideal real community even after the Reformation when it assumes a new ecclesial form. Bauer surmises his ecclesiology at the beginning of the third part of the church history where he addresses the antithesis between Gnosticism and Catholic Church. And it says, The very idea of the Catholic Church is that it should seek to rise above everything particular and merge it in universality of the Christian principle, but on the other hand, it is a no less essential part of its task to maintain and hold fast the positive elements of Christianity. In fact, what constitutes it a Catholic church is that it stands in the middle to harmonize all tendencies and reject the one extreme as much as the other. Had not the idea that developed itself out of Christianity, the idea of the Catholic church, overcome the particularism of Judaism, Christianity itself would have been a mere sect of Judaism. But on the other side there, it comes into contact with paganism. It was threatened by a danger no less serious, namely the generalization and evaporation of its content by ideas through which Christian consciousness spreading out in the limitless expansion would entirely lose its specific historical character. Now this was the tendency of Gnosticism. So I thought Ferdinand Christian Bauer was a Protestant, but it would seem that he doesn't have the Protestant belief that the Catholic Church is the whore of Babylon. Gnosticism introduces speculative and philosophical considerations into Christian theology and stimulates its development in many ways, positive and negative. So Bauer's interpretation of the teachings of Jesus says, in Bauer's words here, Christianity arose on Jewish soil and it is connected with Judaism far more closely and directly. It professes to be nothing other than spiritualized Judaism. It strikes its deepest roots in the soil of the Old Testament religion. The special superiority that distinguishes Judaism from the religions of the pagan world is its pure and refined monotheistic idea of God. In its consciousness of God, therefore, Christianity knows itself to be at one with Judaism. The God of the Old Testament is the God of the New, and all the teachings of the Old Testament concerning the essential distinctness of God from the Word and the absolute sublimity of holiness of God's nature is also an essential part of Christian teaching. But on the other hand, the Old Testament concept of God has so much a national stamp that the particularism Connected with the ensuing form, it stands in the most decisive antithesis to Christianity. How can it stand in, as an antithesis to Christianity when we look at this, for example, scripture in Ezekiel, that the New Testament and Christianity is the unification of the two tribes of Israel? I guess what I find most offensive about this is that Bauer earlier said that the inheritance, or he claimed that the God of Israel was a God for the Jewish people alone, and that they alone are the chosen people. He implies that Judaism is the Jew of his time and of our time and therefore is creating a deception in the fact that he would know because he studied this information and the people who came before him have studied it about the Kabbalah and the Talmud that this isn't the God or the belief of Jesus and the apostles who were preaching Jesus. They weren't preaching the Talmud, they were preaching the Torah. So we have Marcion's doctrine. In Marcion's days, the historical situation was that a hesitant church, according to the Catholic Encyclopedia, even in the days of Marcion, church comprised essentially the Judaist of the previous century. The Jewish predominance already started being challenged before Marcion when Valentine of Alexandria came to Rome around 130 AD. 
brilliant orator who defied the community teaching, introducing his own interpretation of a Jesus-inspired Gnosticism. Accordingly, Christ was the son of a higher deity, son of the Trinitarian cosmic foundation, giving Christ a divine status. As a pure spirit, he could not die on a cross. Valentine refuted the Judean legacy, the law, and considered that scripture was irrelevant. The theological mess induced by the incompatible doctrines is summed by the academic term proto-orthodoxy. This means that the community shared the cherry Jesus but was divided as to which cake it would crown. Having lost the bisphoric election by a narrow miss, Valentine left Rome. Scripture once more became the congregation's authoritative book and the created God resumed his sentinel post. Marcion, it is believed, was at Rome from around 135 to 144 AD. He came with his antithesis, a work comparing the merits of his higher deity opposed to those of Judean created God, a primitive version of Luke, anonymous for the Gospels were not yet attributed to a single author, and a version of the letter to the Galatians he held in high esteem. According to Marcion's understanding, the author of Galatians, a follower of Jesus, supported a different gospel than the Jewish false prophet. At Rome, Marcion seriously challenged the pro-Judean lobby, creating vivid reactions against his teaching. It is therefore not very credible that Marcion would have paid an enormous entrance fee to join a Christian congregation dominated by Judaeus who had just got rid of Valentine. Marcion was already a Doicist, intending to challenge the Roman congregation as previously Valentine. He was not a good Christian of Tertullian's tale imagined a generation after Marcion's death. Marcion's main confession was that Christ's blood saved humanity from the world of death that Yahweh created, a ransom for the many. Contrary to Gnostic elitism, Marcion's God was a loving father receiving his souls with open hands and no wrath more appealing to Gentiles, rejecting the Creator God, the associated scripture and practices made him intolerable to centrist Christian defending the Judean legacies. Rivalry produced texts, the weapons of the learned. In my opinion, Marcion was simply a Pharisee. He was from a shipping family in Revelations. The apostles were warned about those that called themselves Jews or were not, or those that would come preaching another Christ. It says about the dragon being cast out of heaven and being wroth with the woman and these people were cast to the earth. They were cast out of the temple. There was no more Jerusalem and they were in the earth and they were wroth and they were out to destroy Christianity. Acts of the Apostles is a window on the early antagonism between tenets of the Judean legacy opposed to the Hellenistic interpretations. Conflicts between the two groups extended well beyond the 2nd century and according to Bauer, Acts was composed around 140 to 150. The dates match with Marcion's presence at Rome. Now, I wouldn't trust anything Bauer says because he's saying that there's a conflict between Paul and Peter. But the real conflict in Revelation is talking about is a conflict between the Pharisees those that call themselves Jews, the Idumean converts who were in the temple, who were the dragon cast to the earth, casting out their water, their false doctrine, after the saints, they were wroth with the woman. That's where the conflict is. And I believe that people like Marcion and people like Bauer are part of these dragon people. As previously reported, I will consider that before being united, Acts comprised separate monographies, Defending Peter or Paul, guardians of the Judean legacy challenged by Marcion and his school, brought to the fore an actor who had been with the living Jesus according to the preliminary Luke-like gospel Marcion had brought with him to Rome. Instead of seeing in Peter the hesitant follower, the man of little faith, they endorsed him with their own agenda, changing Peter into a loudspeaker of their own claims. Peter receives Jesus' testament from the resurrected Jesus and has power of authority. The spotless focus on Jerusalem and not on Rome. Peter's declaration systematically countered the Marcion Paul tandem, textually established Peter's primacy. So in this article from Preachology, Simon Magus Part 3, 
The Apostle Paul and Peter confronted Simon Magus before Nero. The pseudo-Clementine writings were used in the 4th century by members of the Ebionite sect, one characteristic of which was hostility to Paul, whom they refused to recognise as an apostle. Ferdinand Christian Bauer, founder of the Tübingen School, drew attention to the anti-Pauline characteristic in pseudo-Clementines and pointed out that in the disputations between Simon and Peter, some of the claims Simon is represented as making, e.g. that of having seen the Lord, though not in his lifetime, yet subsequently in visions, were the claims of Paul, and urged that Peter's refutation of Simon was in some place intended as a polemic against Paul. The enmity between Peter and Simon is clearly shown. Simon's magical powers are juxtaposed with Peter's powers in order to express Peter's authority over Simon through the power of prayer. In the 17th homily, the identification of Paul with Simon Magus is affected. Simon is there made to maintain that he has a better knowledge of the mind of Jesus than the disciples who had seen and conversed with Jesus in person. His reason for this strange assertion is that visions are superior to waking reality, as the divine is superior to humans. Peter has much to say in reply to this, but the passage which mainly concerns us is as following. But can anyone be educated for teaching by vision? Moreover, if you say it is possible, why did the teacher remain and converse with walking men for a whole year? Furthermore, how can we believe you even as the fact that he appeared to you. Moreover, how can he appear to you seeing that your sentiments oppose his teaching? However, if you were seen and taught by him for a single hour or so became an apostle, then preach his words, expound his meaning, love his apostles, fight not with me who had conversed with him. For it is against a solid rock, the foundation stone of the church, that you have opposed yourself in opposing me. If you were not an adversary, you would not be slandering me and reviling the preaching that is given through me, in order that as I heard myself in person from the Lord, when I speak, I may not be believed, as though forsooth it were I who was condemned and I was reprobate. Alternatively, if you call me condemned, you are accusing God, who revealed the Christ to me and are inveighing against him, who called me blessed on the ground of the revelation. But if indeed you generally wish to work along with the truth, Learn first from us what we learned from him. And when you have become a disciple of truth, become a fellow workman. I just want to know why in this the disciples don't recognize Paul or Saul because they were persecuted originally by Saul, persecuted Stephen. The anti-Pauline context of the pseudo-Clementines is recognized, but the association with Simon Magus is surprising according to Joseph Verhayden, since they have little in common. However, most scholars accept Bauer's identification, though others, including Lightfoot, argued extensively that the Simon Magus of the pseudo-Clementines was not meant to stand for Paul. More recently, Berlin pastor Hermann Dettering, 1995, has made the case that the veiled anti-Pauline stance of the pseudo-Clementines has historical roots and that the Acts 8 encounter between Simon the Magician and Peter is itself based on the conflict between Peter and Paul. Dettering's belief has not found general support among scholars, but Robert M. Price argues much the same in the amazing Causal Apostle, The Search for the Historical Paul. I think there's an agenda here that they've used these books. I think that there may have been an agenda with the person that wrote these books, the people that wrote these books. The only mention of Simon Magus was Acts eight apparently here we've got Saul and Saul was consenting unto his death and at that time there was a great persecution against the church which was at Jerusalem and they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles and devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him as for Saul he made havoc of the church entering into every house and hailing men and women committed them to prison therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word when philip went down to the city of samaria and preached christ unto them and the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which philip spake hearing and seeing the miracles which he did for unclean spirits crying loud with loud voice came out of many that were possessed with them 
and many taken with palsy and that were lame were healed. And there was a great joy in that city. But there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one, to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is great of the power of God. And to him they had regard because that all long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized both men and women. Then Simon himself believed also, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John who when they were come down prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then laid they hands on them and they received the Holy Ghost. And when Simon saw that they were laying on the apostles' hands, the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power that in whomsoever I lay hands we may receive the Holy Ghost. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast taught that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. So there's nothing more mentioned about Simon here. But, you know, Saul's mentioned up here in the same verse as Simon, uh, as a separate individual. Saul's a Pharisee. So, you know, I know Saul's not a great guy here until he has his conversion, but why would Saul a Pharisee be doing magic up in Samaria? So Saul or Paul was also a Benjamite, so he wasn't an Egemean convert. So anti-Marcionism. There are other features in the portrait which are reminiscent of Marcion. The first thing mentioned in the homilies about Simon's opinions is that he denied that God was just. By God, he meant the creator God. However, he undertakes to prove from the Jewish scriptures that there is a higher God who possesses the perfection, the perfections falsely ascribed to the lower God. On these grounds, Peter complains that when setting out for the Gentiles to convert them from their worship of many gods upon the earth, Satan had sent Simon before him to make them believe that there were many gods in heaven. Medieval legends, later interpretations, the fantastic stories of Simon the sorcerer, persisted into their later Middle Ages, becoming a possible inspiration for the Faust Bosch of Goat Faust. That's interesting. So, wow, um, that's kind of interesting that, you know, uh, Simon Magus may have been the inspiration for Goat Faust. So this Ebionite doctrine comes from this group, meaning the poor or poor ones, as a term refers to a Jewish Christian sect which viewed poverty as blessing and existed during the early centuries of the common era AD. The Ebionites embraced an adoptionist Christology, thus understanding Jesus of Nazareth as a mere man, who by virtue of his righteousness in following the law of Moses was chosen by God to be the Messianic prophet like Moses. A majority of the Ebionites rejected as heresies the orthodox Christian belief in Jesus' divinity, virgin birth and substitutionary atonement that were accepted by the early church and therefore maintained that Jesus was born, the natural son of Joseph and Mary, sought to abolish animal sacrifice by prophetic proclamation and died a martyr in order to move all Israel to repentance. So when we look at the Ebionites, they were an ancient sect of Jews who believed that Jesus was the Messiah and Saviour but denied that he was God in the flesh. So how can they believe, they believe that he's Messiah and Saviour? And, you know, it says that he who denies the Christ is an antichrist, basically. They put great emphasis on Jewish law but claimed that Jesus had abolished the sacrifices and instituted strict vegetarianism. So I wonder if this is kind of linked to the cult of Manai, the Manichaeans, because when we look at how Buddhism spread through India and the Far East, we see that vegetarianism becomes a big issue and today we have this group of people that are trying to cut us off from eating meat and force us into this GMO plant-based diet for the environment, you know, eating bugs. So, 
back in India around these times, there were decrees that went out that people weren't allowed to eat meats. And I kind of wonder if, uh, you know, uh, as I just posted the recent video on the cult of Manai that spread through Asia and seems to have a massive connection to Buddhism. Many critics of biblical Christianity have claimed that the Ebionites were actually the original Jewish, Christian and New Testament Christianity that we know is a later Gentile aberration and or invention of the Apostle Paul. Ironically, the quotations of Ebionite writings that have come down to us point the other direction. They show that the New Testament writings, particularly the canonical gospel, are actually earlier than the Ebionites and are more representative of the early Christian movement. When we look at Mano, he was about 200 AD, so this would fit this statement. The Ebonites had a gospel account of their own, which, like the biblical gospel, purported to tell of the life of Jesus. Indeed, the Ebonite gospel actually utilizes the biblical gospels as its primary source, even Bart Ehrman, an anti-Christian scholar who is not inclined to give any preferential treatment to the biblical sources nevertheless concedes of the Ebionite gospel that it was written in Greek and represented a kind of harmony of the gospels of Matthew, Mark and Luke. The Ebionites had a gospel account of their own which, like the biblical gospel, purported to tell of the life of Jesus. Indeed, the Ebionite gospel actually utilizes the biblical gospel as its primary source, nevertheless concedes of the Ebionite gospel that it was written in Greek and represented a kind of harmony of the Gospels of Matthew, Mark and Luke. In other words, the author of the Ebionite Gospels started with the Bible Gospels and blended them together. An example of this is the narrative of Jesus' baptism. While in the New Testament Gospels do not contradict each other on this story, they all word things slightly differently and give slightly different details. For example, when the voice of the Father speaks from heaven, his words are reported in the Biblical Gospels as this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, Matthew 3.17. You are my beloved son in you I am well pleased, Mark 1.11 and Luke 3.22. Thus the Ebonite gospel weaves the stories together so that the voice from heaven speaks more than once, saying, this is my beloved son and you are my beloved son. At different times, other such details are similarly combined into one longer account. Orthodox Christian writers of the early mid-2nd century like Justin Martyr also often harmonise quotes and stories from the biblical accounts. Titian, one of Justin's students, produced a harmonised gospel of his own called the Diatessaron that also took the stories of the four biblical gospels and combined them into one narrative. Such harmonies not only testify that the New Testament gospels are the more ancient source upon which the Ebionites and Orthodox Christians relied for the information but it also shows that the Gospels already possessed a unique authority among the ancient readers and had a particular trust invested in the content. The Ebonites developed their Jesus narrative after the New Testament Gospels were written and under the assumption that those Gospels were basically a reliable source of information on Jesus' life and teaching. Scholars have also argued that the so-called Clementine homilies are another set of ancient sectarian documents of unknown origin may actually preserve Ebionite material. The author of this material used all four Gospels as sources, though John less so than synoptics. If truly Ebionite, this material from the Clementine homilies offers us yet another example of Ebionite harmonizing and adapting the biblical Gospels for their own end. All of this demonstrates the New Testament Gospel to be the older and more reliable source and the Ebionite account to be a later phenomenon. So the Midrashic expansion. There was a common practice in ancient Jewish communities to produce literary interpretations of sacred texts called Midrash. That, among other things, often explained biblical texts through stories that expanded the narrative and added details. So this is a lot of the, the Jewish myths come out of the Midrash because they expand on biblical concepts in the Torah, sometimes including whole new legendary episodes. Often such Midrashic tales made their way into the loose, paraphrastic, interpretive translations known as the Targums. These were copies of the Old Testament text, usually in Aramaic, that were meant to not only translate but to explain and bring to life the text for the common, less learned people. For example, in Deuteronomy 6, 4-5, the actual text reads, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. 
You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. The Jerusalem Targums expand this into when the end had come to our father Jacob that he should be taken up from the world, he called the twelve tribes his son and gathered them around his couch. Then Jacob our father rose up and said to them, Do you worship any idol that Terah, the father of Abraham, worshipped? Do you worship any idol that Laban, the brother of his mother, worshipped or worshipped you, the God of Jacob? The twelve tribes answered together with fullness of heart and said, Hear now, Israel, our father, the Lord our God is one Lord. Jacob responded and said, May his great name be blessed forever, and you shall love instruction of the Lord with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your wealth. The gospel texts used by the Ebonites appear to have shown this same kind of Midrashic expansion. For example, Matthew 10 records the names of the 12 apostles as they are called to preach to the towns of Israel. The Ebonite gospel expands the naming of the 12 into the following narrative. When he came to Capernaum, he entered the house of Simon, also called Peter, and he opened his mouth to say, As I was passing by the lake of Tiberias, I chose John and James, the son of Zebedee, and Simon, Andrew, Thaddeus, Simon, the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot. And I called you Matthew while you were sitting in the tax collector's booth, and you followed me. I want you therefore to be the twelve apostles as a witness to Israel. Similarly, in Matthew 12, 9-10, we are told of an ancient incident involving a man with a withered hand who was healed on the Sabbath. Departing from thee, he went into the synagogue, and a man was there whose hand was withered. And they questioned Jesus, asking, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? So they might accuse him. Jerome preserves for us how the passage was expanded in what he calls the gospel that the Nazarene and the Ebonites used, explaining the man with the withered hand is described as a mason who sought help in words like these i was a mason who made a living with my hands i beseech you jesus restore my health so i do not have to beg for food shamefully now this is kind of interesting because i wonder if this is where the mason's hidden hand symbology comes from because we know that in uh leviticus moses places down his staff the staff turns to a serpent and he has to grab the staff by the tail and it turns back into a staff and then his hand turns white and leprous and he places it inside of his shirt or on his chest and his hand then is healed. So this Ebionite Mason story, the Ebionites were said to be Pharisees. So does this prove some kind of link between the uh, rabbi class and the Freemasons? This not only provides further evidence that these Jewish Ebionites preserved a later expanded form of the New Testament Gospels, they show that the New Testament Gospels not only existed but were in fact already held as authoritative scripture by the time the Ebionites came along and created their Gospels. Midrashic expansions were not made for random historical sources. Midrash was an explanatory expansion on authoritative texts. So again, even the Ebionite sect actually provides us evidence that the New Testament Gospels are indeed the older and more authoritative sources for true Christianity. Finally, the Ebionite Gospel displays obvious alterations of the stories to fit their own doctrinal developments. For example, the Ebionites were vegetarians and they changed the narrative to support this view. On the diet of John the Baptist, the New Testament Gospel tells us now John himself had a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. The Ebionites altered the text to say, and John was baptizing, and Pharisees came to him and were baptized, as was all of Jerusalem. John wore a garment of camel hair and leather around his waist, and his food was wild honey that tasted like manna, like a cake cooked in oil. They removed the locusts to make John a vegetarian. Biblical Christians have no, had no attachment to eating locusts and had no special reason to report that John ate them other than the fact that he did. This is kind of uh, funny with the, the old Klaus Schwab story, let them eat bugs. But also, he wasn't a vegan. John wasn't a vegan because he wore camel's hair and a leather belt. The Ebionites, however, did have an important reason to deny that John ate locusts. They altered the text to support their teaching. They did this again later in the Gospel where the New Testament says, Now on the first day 
of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, where do you want us to prepare for you to eat Passover? And he said, go into the city to a certain man and say to him, the teacher says, my time is near. I am to keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. The disciples did as Jesus had directed them and they prepared the Passover. Matthew 26, 17 to 19. The Ebionite Gospel adds an extra clause to the conversation to bring it in line with their view. When the disciples ask where Jesus wants them to prepare the Passover, Jesus begins by sternly clarifying, I have no desire to eat meat of this Passover lamb with you. These and other such examples lead scholars to conclude that Ebionite gospel writers appear to reinterpret both Jewish and Jesus traditions. The Ebionites are not the preservers of an original Jewish faith. They are the sect that alter the Christian faith to suit their own novel doctrines. Yet, even in doing so, they provide an additional line of evidence to us that the canonical gospels of the New Testament are indeed the older and more reliable source on who Jesus really is and therefore on true Christianity. As much as certain modern critics may wish to find real Christianity in some lost ancient sect, the truth is that these later offshoots all show signs of their novelty and point back to the fact that Orthodox New Testament Christianity is the true heir to Jesus' teaching. The biblical gospels are early, authoritative and reliable. We should accept no substitutes. So here's all his references here in this article. And what what can I say? If the Ebionites are the writers of this anti-Paul doctrine uh, that Paul was Simon Magus, this is where it originates from. These people are changing the scriptures to suit themselves. And we have the lying antichrist spirit of Ferdinand Christian Bauer using this Ebionite information to cause a division in Christianity and to undermine the foundation of the Apostle Paul and the Apostle Peter for nefarious reasons in my opinion. I think that he is a controlled Rothschild family member and I think that all of this Hebrew roots, anti-Paul doctrine originates right here with these Ebionite Jewish Christian cult that is already altering the apostles' scriptures to suit themselves. They're nothing but Pharisees who at around this time period converted to Christianity to suit themselves, obviously, and this is where the doctrines of Marcion come out and it's highly likely that Manai from the Manichaean sect was one of them because he was from this, he was grew up in a Jewish Christian sect. And then we have all this information about the Manichaeans moving out into Asia and being linked to the Buddhist movement. So, Ferdinand Christian Bauer, father of studies of Jewish Christianity. It was Bauer who gave lucid expression to the central questions in the study of Jewish Christianity. Ferdinand Christian Bauer laid the foundation and much of the structure of modern historical critical study in the New Testament. His provocative thesis that the original believers in Jesus were in fact what later generations of the institutional church considered heretical continues to challenge and dismay both scholars and regular churchgoers alike. Ferdinand Christian Bauer was a German Protestant theologian and founder and leader of the Tübingen School of Theology. Bell was prepared to apply his theory to the whole of the New Testament. In the words of H.S. Nash, he carried a sweeping hypothesis into the examination of the New Testament. He considers those writings alone genuine in which the conflict between Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians is clearly marked. He turns his attention to the Gospels and here again finds that the authors were conscious of the conflict of parties gospel reveals a mediating or conciliatory tendencies on the part of writers or redactors. The gospels in fact are adaptations or redactions of an older gospel such as the gospel of the Hebrews or Peter or the Egyptians or the Ebionites. The Petrine Matthew bears the closest relationship to the original gospel. Pauline Luke is later and arose independently. Mark represents a still later development according to Bauer the account of John is idealistic. It does not possess historical truth and cannot and does not really lay claim to it. Bauer's theory starts with the supposition that Christianity was gradually developed out of Judaism. 
Before it could become a universal religion, it had to struggle with Jewish limitations and overcome them. In applying this method, Bauer, to mention some of his most important historical results, saw in Christianity the higher union of paganism and Judaism. He regarded primitive Christianity from the perspective of an opposition between a Jewish Christian Petrine Christianity and a Gentile Christian Pauline Christianity, both of which are transcended in a Joannine Christianity. He understood Galatians as the thesis, Corinthians as the antithesis, and Romans as the synthesis. Starting from the Gospel of John as synthesis among the Gospel, he saw the Jewish Christian Matthew as the earliest Gospel. In this book here by Samuel L. Lonka, PhD, it says, Why Marcion Matters? Imagine a Christianity without Judaism, a Bible with no Israel, no Torah, no law and prophets, and finally a Jesus without a history, revealing a God separate from the unknown to the world prior to Jesus, appearance in history. In such an imagined act, one comes close to the imagining of the understudied truth of modern Christian theology, that such a form of Christianity and Christianity without Judaism lies in the foundation of Protestant liberalism. This form of Christianity is not new to the modern world, but is associated with the arch heretic of early Christianity, Marcion of Sinope. In the second century AD, Marcion taught that Jesus was the revelation of an unknown God, a totally hidden divinity that had nothing to do with creation, which was the work of the God of Jewish people who were still awaiting their Messiah. The Jewish God was a God of justice and wrath, while the God of Jesus was a God of pure grace who had come to deliver humanity, though not the Jewish leaders, from the world. Christianity thus had nothing to do with Judaism, and as a result, Marcion eliminated the Jewish scriptures from the Christian Bible and excluded all parts of what would become the New Testament that seemed too Jewish. In the standard narrative of church history, Marcion thereby inaugurated the formalization of orthodox canon of scriptures, making him one of the most important heretics in Christian history. In the 19th century, the 20th centuries, Marcion enjoyed a great revival and his thought became associated with the leading thinkers in German theology. By the early 20th century, Marcionism was so important in German theology that Franz Rosenweig claimed that form of Christianity to which he had been so attracted was that of Marcionism. When Karl Barth, the most influential figure of the 20th century theology, published his groundbreaking commentary on Romans, a canny earlier reader, Adolf Julcher, compared his theology to that of Marcion, and Barth himself later acknowledged the similarities moreover. Every major liberal historical theologian from Ferdinand Christian Bauer to Albrecht Ritschel to Adolf von Harnack had a deep interest in Marcion. And during the Third Reich, the Marcionist view of Scripture, a totally de Judaizing canon, became the center of a movement to eliminate Jewish influence on the German church and insist that Jesus was not Jewish but Aryan. I can see an agenda here. It's to divert perhaps the lost tribes of Israel away from the idea that perhaps they are Israelites like Jesus and make Jesus Aryan. Yet the significance of Marcionism has been studied only piecemeal and has not risen to the disciplinary consciousness of any of the fields it affects such as Judaic studies, intellectual history or Christian theology and the study of anti-Judaism. Nor has there been a systematic consideration of whether the current of Marcionism is modern German theology contributed to the theological anti-Judaism and anti-Semitism that came to expression in National Socialism. Although there is some awareness of this interest in Marcionism spread throughout various scholarly fields, there is no dedicated scholarly account of the origins of this interest. Its significance for Protestant liberalism and crucially its relationship to anti-Judaism. So I can think of a reason and I think it's to divert the people of Europe away from who they really are. This group of rabbis who claim that they have the inheritance of Abraham. And who benefits from this Marcion philosophy in Marcion's time as well as our time? And that would be the Idumean convert. Because we see that the apostles have gone out to the southern kingdom of Judah 
and to the northern kingdom of Ephraim. But what inheritance does the Idumean convert have? And as we see with the Jacob and Esau story, Esau tried to murder Jacob so that he could gain that inheritance and blessing. For Marcion's form of Christianity is the most explicitly anti-Judaic version of Christian ever envisioned and thus the Marcionite's character of modern German theology would seem relevant to scholars concerned about anti-Judaism as well as Christian-Jewish relations. Yet the Marcionist pattern in modern thought has been only occasionally noted in the excellent work on these subjects such as the most recent and thorough survey of anti-Judaism, David Nirenberg's Anti-Judaism, the Western Tradition. Marcion's role in modern theology is not mentioned and in Susanna Herschel's back groundbreaking work on Christianity and the Bible under National Socialism, the Aryan Jesus, Marcion is mentioned but once. Alan Confino's recent work, A World Without Jews, which opens by asking how the Nazis came to burn the Hebrew Bible, does not mention Marcion. What does Marcion, the time of Marcion, have in common with the time of the Reformation? You know, I can see in the early church, we've got the two apostles, Paul and Peter, going out to the two groups, the northern and the southern kingdom of Israel, the Greeks and the Jews. And there's a group of people called Pharisees and Sadducees and Sanhedrin who really hate the fact that Jesus the Messiah is being preached to these people because they do not want these two kingdoms to be reunited. Since Christianity has supplied so much of the material for the justifications of prejudice against Judaism as a religion and the Jews as a people, and since the great theorists of Christianity are its theologians and philosophers, anti-Judaism represents an organic intersection of all these. Well, I have to disagree with that because Judaism is not Hebraic. You know, these books that they follow, if it was the Torah and the Torah only, then yeah, you could say, well, this is a good thing, but they've got these Kabbalistic works from Babylon. These people are from Babylon. Who was Marcion and what did he teach? Marcion of Sinope was born sometime near the end of the first century and was a contemporary of Justin Martyr. His father was the Bishop of Sinope and it is possible that Marcion's family was Jewish in background. Here we go. Jaroslav Palikin reflect the perspective of a Christian historian of doctrine observed that it is evident that certain forms of Judaism were the origin of the earliest form of Christian heresy. Nevertheless, the most important early heresies were not Jewish but anti-Jewish in their inspiration. Marcionism can justly be regarded as the most extreme form of anti-Jewish Christianity in the history of the early church. Hanak, who was sympathetic to Marcion, argues that his Christianity is built upon a resentment towards Judaism and its religion. Now, why are all these people who are anti-Jewish and teaching these anti-Jewish doctrines actually Jewish themselves? You know, it, to me, there's, they've, they've got this dualistic agenda. As it's saying here, there was a resurgence of Marcionism at this time in German Christianity that's pretty much set the scene for modern Christianity and part of this counter-reformation situation. Says here, Ferdinand Christian Bauer, the founder of the Tübingen School, was the most influential advocate of the essentially Marcionist theory of the New Testament and early Christianity to which O'Neill referred. But he was also a theologian who founded the discipline of historical theology and did extensive and deeply influential scholarship on the history of the Christian church. It's theology and Gnosticism. Bauer saw in the thought of Schleimacher and his contemporaries the resurgence of what he called Christian Gnosis. Bauer recognised in Schleimacher's thought a religious philosophical foundation that was in accord with earlier forms of Gnosticism and he was quick to note not only Schleimacher's position on Judaism and the Old Testament but also its antecedent, the history of the philosophy of religion present, no more noteworthy parallel to Schleimacher's position on the Old Testament and his antipathy to Judaism than the antinominalism of Marcion. Bauer thus recognised the deeply anti-Jewish character of Schleimacher's thought and compared it to Marcion's. So it is no accident that it is Adolf von Harnack, author of the history of theology with which every other scholar in the field of early Christianity must contend, who also wrote that 
what has remained the standard scholarly study of Marcion. Harnack was the great representative of liberal theology in Wilhelmine, Germany, and the founding father of the scholarly tradition in historical theology that produced B.A. Gerish and Jaroslav Pelikan, among others. Harnack recognized the connection between Bauer's Tübingen school and Marcion, judging that although Bauer did not deny that Paul recognized the Old Testament and the God of the Old Testament, Bauer's difference from Marcion is not so great, for to him, Paul too had surrendered in idea the Old Testament God. And in a certain sense, he was correct. In this assertion, Hanek likewise recognizes Schleimacher's connection to Marcion on the historical, critical, and religious grounds. Then it follows from this with inescapable necessity, particularly since the concept of inspiration in its old sense was dissolved, that any sort of equation of the Old Testament with the New Testament and any authority for the Old Testament in Christianity cannot be maintained. Schleimacher and others along with him clearly recognized this. Marcion was given his due. They're preaching this doctrine basically that distinguishes Jew from Gentile as being something completely separate, that the origins of their faith are completely separate. Well, they are really because when we look at who the Jews we know today are, but it's the deception that somehow these people are the rightful heirs of the southern kingdom, Judah, and that they claim the whole inheritance of Israel. Where's the other ten tribes? And how they're doing this is quite deceptive because what they're doing is they're pitting Peter and Paul against each other, like somehow they had some different ministry or that Paul was a false apostle because the importance of Paul and Peter were that one group of apostles went to the tribes of Judah, they went to the Jew first, and Paul the apostle went to the Gentile or the Greek, the Hellene, the lost tribes of Israel. And this was the fulfillment of Ezekiel where the two sticks were put together as one in the hand of Jesus. We have to be really careful of this anti-Paul doctrine and now we can see where it's originated and it's been in the church, in the Christian teaching, almost from the very beginning. Um, there's only one reason for this and that these people have this suspect background related to the rabbi class and to Freemasonry and Jesuits. So in this book, it says chapter 5, Bauer and the creation of the Judaism-Hellenism dichotomy from Ferdinand Christian Bauer and, and the history of early Christianity. It says here in chapter 5, this chapter argues that Bauer created a dichotomy between Judaism and Hellenism. Despite the fact that Bauer rarely used the term Hellenism and focused instead on the differences between Jewish Christians and Gentile or Pauline Christians. So he emphasized the word Gentile as like making out that they were somehow different to Jews or Pauline Christians based principally on evidence in the Pauline epistles. The author believes that Bauer reduced a complex variety of Jewish and Hellenist positions in the first century to a simple dichotomy following a Hegelian theory of opposition and that the Bowerian view influenced New Testament scholarship for nearly a century. The bulk of this chapter is devoted to a thorough analysis of the concept Jewish and Hellenistic and propose an alternative history of development. It states that Bauer is guilty of prejudices characteristic of 19th century Orientalism. And, you know, this ties into Blavatsky and all of these Persian and Indian gods that all come from the one source. So I can't find any information on Bauer online, whether he was linked to Jesuits or whether he actually was indeed some kind of Rothschild. With a name like Bauer, you would assume he was and that he's a pseudo-Jew. He seems to be linked to all these schools of thought, but there's nothing there proving he has some sort of uh, agenda background. But, you know, his words and his beliefs certainly show he does have an agenda here. And it says... German theologian and scholar of Manichaeism, the most important was Bauer's view of Manichaeism as a religion born at the watershed of the ancient and Christian worlds. This is Encyclopedia Iranica online from Brill. It says, Bauer, Ferdinand Christian, German theologian and 
Gola of Manichaeism. He was the son of a Protestant pastor. Yeah, we've seen that before. So that, you know, doesn't mean that he's a Protestant. Bauer is described as an impressive university teacher, but in his last years, he was to witness the downfall of his school. In Prussia, advocates of Bauer's undogmatic historical approach accounted bureaucratic obstacles and found themselves compelled either to follow the officially approved line in their teaching or to choose other careers. It must be added that too rigid or biased application of Bauer's method to canonical texts had in some cases given rise to distortions and errors. With Bauer's death in 1860, his school also expired. In the same year, 1831, in which the essay on early Christian history came out, Bauer published his second monumentous work. In it, the Hegelian critical method for which Bauer later became so well known is not used. The book earned a scholarly reputation in a much wider sphere than the circle of Lutheran theologians. It is a general survey of the Manichaean teaching, admirably methodical, based on all the then available sources with sound assessment of their work and still valid on most important points. It has been the model for all subsequent accounts on this religion. Most important was Bauer's view of Manichaeism. As a religion born at the watershed of the ancient and Christian worlds, he considered Manichaeism to be the last great assemblage of ancient pre-Christian nature spirit beliefs, which expressed religious consciousness in figurative disguise, focusing it on man's imprisonment in the universe rather than in his inner life and seeing each individual soul as a reflection of the common world soul. Manichaeism therefore played the same role as Neoplatonism did in Greco-Roman society. Bauer rightly concluded that Manichaeism was not a Christian heresy but a world religion. So what's a world religion? And that it set forth an oriental doctrine. And you know, don't all the world religions today have oriental doctrines? At the same time, Bauer was aware that Manichaean syncretism flowed from many different sources. With regards to Zoroaster's teachings, Bauer rightly attached great importance to the shared dualism of Zoroastrians and Manichaeans and held that in his respect, Manichaeism had its deepest roots in Zoroastrianism. But he also recognized great difference between them and refuted the then common opinion that Manichaeism was merely a combination of Zoroastrianism and Christianity. Against this, he regarded Buddhism as an important formative influence, finding evidence in a wide range of shared features. That theory was contested by contemporary critics and has not been borne out by subsequent research, which credits Buddhism with at most a minor role in the genesis of Manichaeism. Now, I just did a small video on Buddhism and Manichaeism and Islam and it would appear that Manichaeism actually had a lot to do with Buddhism and there were Manichaean priests all throughout Asia around the time of the spread of Buddhism which started around 250 AD onwards. It should be noted however that Bauer had in mind not only a direct influence of Buddhism on Manai but also an indirect influence through the channel of Gnosticism. He saw evidence of this in the story of Simon Magus in the pseudo-Clementine homilies, has his citations really amounted to no more than speculative surmises. Nevertheless, recent research has perhaps surprisingly lent force to Bauer's conclusion that certain details of the homilies point to a source which appeared to have been the same, or at least very nearly the same, as the source from which Manichism flowed. It is now known from the so-called Manai Codex at Cologne that Manai was bred in a Judeo-Christian ecclesiastic environment. This disclosure, of course, necessitates revisions of Bauer's appraisal of the importance of Christianity in the formation of the Manichism system. More was involved in Manai's relationship with Christianity than a form of the old nature religion clad in the language of Christianity. So this keeps coming up with Simon Magus and this Gnostic Zoroastrian type of Christianity, which pretty much we have in today's Catholic Church. So, you know, Ferdinand Christian Bauer, he had a lot of influence on modern Christianity. Uh, all of these other philosophers and, and Christian commentators did also, uh, for the worst. I think they were trying to corrupt the church and to 
create confusion, causes division between Jew and Gentile and confuse people as of who they really are in the kingdom of God. Around the time of the Reformation when there were genuine people working to get the scriptures out to the average man and woman. I mean, there were obviously corruptions in the Reformation, but there were people that were burnt at the stake as well and people don't give their lives up for a corruption or for a an agenda. They give their lives up for the absolute truth and I think these were genuine people working for God. There's definitely an agenda here. These people all have the same theology, which is this Oriental religion and Kabbalah. So I can't find any suspect background on him, but all of the people he follows and the philosophies he follows are definitely suspect. But this video is getting very long right now, and I'm going to continue on with Schliemacher and the German Romantic period in the next video. So I hope this gives you a better understanding of who Ferdinand Christian Bell was and how he changed Protestant Christianity and had a massive influence on the direction of the church in the modern era. Thanks for listening, everyone, and I'll see you in the next episode.